Imagine sending your son to college to play football, but ends up dying, possibly by his roommate, a roommate whom he reported to his coach about pointing a gun at him days before being killed. That happened to a Texas family and their son, Ronnie Caldwell Jr., who was attending Northwestern State University in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Ronnie's parents say his death could have been prevented. Troy Predia and Jonathan Cox from the Cox Predia Law Firm represent the Caldwell family. They now join from Houston. All right, so, gentlemen, what actually happened here? What, what, when did this take place? What went on there in this Louisiana? Was this a dormitory? Was this an off-campus apartment? What happened? Well, Roland, um, on October the 9th, Ronnie Caldwell Jr. reached out to his father and said, hey, my roommate pulled a weapon on me. Can you please call Coach Brad Laird to have me put in another apartment in the same complex? So Ronnie Caldwell Sr. called Coach Brad Laird and, well, text Coach Brad Laird, and Brad Laird responded and said that he would move Ronnie Caldwell Jr. Uh, three days later, no action by Coach Brad Laird, uh, the roommate, Shot and killed Ronnie Caldwell Jr. Okay, so shot and killed him. Um, what happened to the roommate? The roommate was arrested for drug possession and gun charges. Uh, the, the case is still under investigation on the murder charge. So, you know, we're not going to state who killed them. We're going to let the police decide that in the district attorney's office. And so we're waiting on that uh, investigation to, to be complete. Okay, but so what I'm saying, so was the roommate arrested? Arrested not for murder, but for weapons charges and drug possession. Okay. Um, what then happened? Uh, he said he report he went to the coach. Was that verbal? Was that written? Was that text? Uh, do you have any? Do you have anything um, from Ronnie that shows that he did indeed reach out to the coach about this issue? So, Roland, this is Jonathan Cox here, Cox Bay Law Firm. Uh, we've been kind of conducting our own investigation. Uh, so, what we have discovered is that, in addition to Ronnie calling his father and letting him know about the situation with his roommate. Um, he had also been going to the apartment complex saying that he wanted to be moved. What we have here, Roland, is an is a apartment complex that is uh, marketed to be a student housing facility, but they also uh, lease to non-students. And so Ronnie was with a roommate in an apartment. He had a mold issue, and they moved him to an apartment with a non-student. And he was in there probably three to four months before his death. And during that whole time, he had made complaints to the apartment complex. He wanted to move out of that apartment complex. The guy was uh, just somebody who wasn't like-minded as him. And it ultimately ended up in this situation. And once the report was made to the coach, they still didn't do anything. And three days later, he was dead. Um, again, uh, head coach Brad Laird resigned. Ronnie's father uh, sent a text message to the coach saying that he needed help um, getting Ronnie moved, saying that the um, uh, roommate, uh, Josh McIntosh, pulled a gun on him. Uh, as you said, McIntosh was arrested for possession of a firearm in the presence of a controlled dangerous substance. Also, uh, another uh, player, Maurice Campbell II, uh, he was also uh, arrested uh, for obstruction of justice, possession of marijuana with the intent to distribute, and possession of a firearm in the presence of a controlled dangerous uh, substance. Now, um, it how long... Um, so, Ronnie gets shot. How long does it take for paramedics to arrive at this apartment? Well, we have different reports. Some say 10 minutes. Somebody said an hour. We're not really sure. We need to get the reports from the the ambulance service. So we're, we won't speculate about that. We have an investigator down there on the ground, and uh, we're just still trying to find out about that. So we're not really sure uh, where, whether it was 10 minutes or whether it was 30 minutes or whether it was an hour. So uh, what's weird to me is, so, the, so the, 
Coach Laird resigns, and this is a statement that he put out. It's actually is sort of strange to me. He said, due to, due to the loss of Ronnie and the emotional burden it has caused, I don't feel I can give my all to these players or this program. Any coach would tell you that their players become like family. So the loss of Ronnie was like losing a son. I love this program and this university, and I know it pers persevere and move forward with the competitive spirit that is at the core of our DNA. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confused here. Um, you're the head coach. Season's canceled. You bail out. You bail, and now the players and everyone else, they're sort of like, what do we do now? And you're saying, oh, I just don't know how it can go on? Yeah, Roland, what was disturbing about this is up until the time that he uh, resigned, the narrative was out there that it was just a random shooting at a school between two black kids, and and there was no involvement with the school. But once he resigned, the family was really upset about that because they knew that there was more to this story. They had called the school, or called the coach. The coach said that he was going to do something about it. And he never did, but that was never reported in any of the news outlets uh, after Ronnie was killed. Uh, and it wasn't brought out until we called the press conference the day after the coach resigned. And so uh, it, it appeared that they were trying to sweep this under the rug and have him resign and distance themselves away from Coach Laird. Wow. Um, well, certainly... Uh... More details need to come out. Uh, we await uh, for those details. We await for uh, the university also uh, to speak to this. Now, you have already filed, e even though the criminal case uh, is still moving forward, uh, you, you filed a lawsuit against the university? So we have not filed yet, Roland. What we're doing, we're working in conjunction with a, a Louisiana law firm, a multi-jurisdictional law firm, Daniel Williams Law Firm, and we are uh, in the process of preparing that suit. Uh, we expect to have this suit filed in the next couple of days. Okay. Gentlemen, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, man, that has got to be tough uh, there, Joy. Again, if you're a parent, your son reaches out, says, hey, my roommate pulls a gun on me. You're the father. You reach out to the head coach. Nothing happens. He's not moved. Nothing changes. And next thing you know, as this story says, uh, the father gets a phone call at 2.07 a.m. saying your son is dead. It's tragic. Um, my stepson is a sophomore at the University of Chicago, and I cannot imagine um, what that would feel like, what that would be like. The fact that he was even living with someone who wasn't a student, I'm not sure how that happened and was also on the team. Um, you know, the, I think more details need to be there. And I can't help but feel like there is um, a current here that young men, especially when they're young black men, that they are um, superhuman, older than they actually are. Um, he might have been an adult on paper, but he was young. This was, you know, if he were a white girl, we would have no problem saying she was, you know, almost a child, right? Barely an adult. This young man was young. And he called out for help from his parents who did the right thing, who went to the coach. And he did not get that assistance. And the school has something to answer for there. It's tragic. Tragic. Also goes to show what we are dealing with when we talk about guns in this society, Mustafa. Um, go to my iPad. Uh, this is a story out of New York where uh, a, a New York City father and his stepson, um, two brothers, they are dead because one of their neighbors was complaining about, uh, was complaining about the noise. Uh, and what is so stunning here is that, um, again, the neighbor was you know, knocking on the door, then the father, who's a weightlifter, comes out holding a pair of scissors. Uh, they have an altercation. And, uh, and and reading the story was also interesting is that uh, the, the wife came out, and then when 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 the the stepfather walks out, the wife tries to stop him from walking out of the house, out of the apartment, but he he pushes her away. Uh, then when he uh, when he uh, confronts uh, the gentleman here, what then happens is guy pulls a gun out, the father blows the guy off and turns his back on him. The guy then fires shots 
into, uh, into him. Then he fires two shots into the stepson. And then as uh, the father is crawling to his doorway, the guy walks up to him and shoots him execution style. Uh, and this goes to, again, and I say this all the time. I don't care what anybody says. People act totally different when they've got a gun in their possession. They are the biggest tough guy. All of a sudden, they are ready to do damage. It, this always happens, Mustafa. I, I don't care what anybody says. I fundamentally believe that a person acts completely different and far more rational when they do not have a weapon as compared to that false sense of um, insecurity, entitlement, and bravado when they do have a gun. Oh, without a doubt. And we live in a society here in the United States where we have more guns than we have people. The numbers are almost at 400 million guns. Those are the guns that folks know about that exist inside of this country. So when you have the mix of both guns and then you have all these stressors that people are dealing with, you just have this mix where folks just want to pull on folks. Um, and not only did the father get shot, but also there was another person that got shot. This individual, I watched the video. I try to stay away from that stuff, but it caught my attention. You know, he put multiple shots in the folks. And he also made sure that he had headshots on folks. Yep. So he was serious about ending people's lives. And now his life, um, you know, he's actually going to end up in prison because whether he gets away with the father that he shot, he's definitely not going to get away with the other individual who made no advances toward him. But it all comes back to the fact that we continue to flood our communities with these weapons um, instead of folks figuring out ways to de-escalate, step back for a second, be like, yo, let's talk about this later, a walk away. Um, and unfortunately, whether it's the, you know, we're watching movies all the time where people are getting shot, we got all these other things that make it seem like it is, it, it's not real. But as soon as you pull that trigger, the reality becomes that somebody is going to get hurt or somebody's going to lose their life. And one of the reasons also is that we won't move forward on significant gun legislation. We continue. It goes back to what we've been talking about all day. We got these folks on Capitol Hill who don't care about everyday people, are willing to sacrifice people because they continue to get all this money from the gun lobby and all these other types of places. And we've just got to, one, utilize the power of our vote to change this dynamic. But we also have to make sure that we're doing some work in our communities. I used to work for an organization called Root Inc., reaching out to others together. We specifically focused on trying to de-escalate and trying to mitigate these uh, gun violence situations that continue to go on. Um, and we just don't have enough resources that go to those types of organizations. And guess who's real quiet, Randy? The gun people and the pro-lifers. Oh. Always. <laughs> the, I'm sorry, the so-called pro-lifers. Right, always. I mean, whenever, you know, we're involved, um, you, don't, you don't hear a whole lot from them. They speak up only when it serves their contingency. Um, I, I really just want to go back to about what Joy was saying, that our Black young men, our Black men uh, are not seen as people and, you know, people who need help. I mean, that's the, what really strikes me about this. I have not a doubt in my mind that if a young 20-year-old white girl had called and said that her roommate had pulled a weapon on her, a weapon, she would have been moved that day, right? Or that roommate would have been moved out. I mean, this is not something... He didn't complain and say, he's dirty. He didn't complain and say he plays his music too loud. He said, this person has pulled a weapon on me. <laughs> that child was asking for help and received none. And I believe it is because people are desensitized to violence within the Black community and believe that we are supposed to be able to handle it. It's no big deal for him. You know, he probably comes from a place that he's used to that type of stuff. And that is the part that is really scary to me about that case.